Good afternoon. Uh, Ted, Ted like talks. I discovered um, when I told my daughters with great pride I'm giving a Ted talk. Some of them checked it out online and said, no, no, it's a Ted like talk. So, you know. <laughs> you know. so um, I'm going to go through some of the recent data about um, kind of the gender differences in autism and maybe how that can help us find something very important, which are modifier genes. And it's just, this is really kind of a you know, early days for this field, and so it's more about what might be possible in the future. So um, one thing that seems that's clearly inc incontrovertible is that there are more boys with autism than girls with autism. And there was a brief period where people thought that maybe that girls were less likely to get a diagnosis because of just kind of biases in the system, but it's quite clear now that there is repeatedly and across study after study after study, um, more, boys than, more, more boys than girls with autism. So that's kind of a foundation truth that maybe can lead us to insights. So um, shameless plug, um, the Autism Sequencing Consortium is something that came together in 2010 with the idea of prospective data sharing. Um, is there a laser here? No. So, so the idea is, um, Prospective data sharing is where when you generate data, you share it before you publish. So it's kind of, you've heard about the viper's nest of autism uh, earlier on from Tom. Um, things have gotten much better. People are much more willing on the science side to share uh, their data in a, in a prospective way. And the idea of the ASC was to put together all the genetic data we possibly could, no matter who funded it, no matter where in the world it was generated, and get together to have at least 20,000 individuals where the, every gene in their genome was sequenced and understand, contribute to understanding the genetic causes of autism. Because gene discovery is not an end to itself, it's the first step in coming up with new treatments. So we just um, yesterday presented the final, final clean data to the network. There are 14,000 samples in the ASC where every gene, every of the 20,000 genes in a person are sequenced in every person. And there are 107 likely genes so far, very likely autism genes, not including the sex chromosomes. Um, I'll say that, that little thing with the yellow circle says the exact number of samples. It's 13,860. You can't see it. Um, this came together because of kind of visionary support from the Zero Foundation and critical support from the NIMH and NHGRI to make it happen. So that's the shameless plug. Here's the really amazing news about what we see so far. In the top 100 genes, okay, there are, there are 19 genes in the genome associated with a single process, which is methylation and demethylation of lysines on histones. Can't really see that. There are 19 genes of the 22,000 that do this. Nine of them are mutated in autism. So what that tells us is that in spite of the com complex genetic architecture of autism, they tend to channel in onto specific pathways. That means that you don't have to make a drug for 1,000 autisms. Maybe you need to develop therapeutics for seven autisms or 10 autisms, subgroups of autism. This little kind of starburst picture on the right is a way of showing how genes interact. And what you can see in red are all genes associated with autism in this finding, or green, or purple. And they all are shown to be bound together by an underlying brain network. So this kind of is kind of reinforce this idea that we're getting not only, it's, sure, it's really complicated. There are hundreds of genes, but they're coalescing into pathways. And one of the things that the BrainSpan data set, which you heard about in terms of develop, looking at the development of gene expression over the brain, you can actually map these genes during development. That, and you can show that a lot of these genes map to early fetal development. So we can actually get even to the parts of the brain and the layers of the brain where all this is happening. Here's what happens when you look at all the genes together in the ASC, the Autism Sequencing Consortium. If you look at the top 33 genes, and that's just a cutoff of, a, of, of a, what I will call very, very likely genes. And you look at the ratio of those mutations between girls and boys. Girls are the white bars and boys are the black bars. You see that and all the way on the left there, the DNLOF stands for de novo, which means a new mutation. So it's not found in mom or dad, but it happened when the egg or sperm were generated. De novo loss of function, which are the most deleterious or worst mutations, are twice as common in girls with autism as in boys with autism. That's true whether you look at the top 33 genes, the top 100 genes, or if you look at every gene in the genome. If you look at 22,000 genes in girls with autism, they are twice as likely to have a de novo bad mutation 
than boys. If you look at less severe mutations, the so-called de novo missense 3, again, you can see that there's many more examples of that in girls versus boys, whether you look at the top genes, the top 100, 100 genes. And if you go to less severe mutations, that balance begins to shift to more what you'd expect, which is one to one. What that tells us is that girls are protected. They need a greater hit, a greater genetic load in this case, to manifest with autism, okay? So why is that possibly important? So this is kind of a, an amazing study that came out very recently. And it was done in mice. And in mice, you can genetically modify mice, just like you can genetically modify in corn. But the advantage of modifying mice is that you can understand what their brain is doing in the presence of a mutation. You can take a human mutation, put it into the same gene in a mouse, look at that mouse's brain in real time. So one of the genes that's involved in the autism spectrum is, RET, is MECP2, MECP2, which causes Rett syndrome, a very severe form of autism that's degenerative uh, and, and quite, quite terrible. Um, the mice with the same mutation uh, die early, okay? And so this group did a rescue study. They asked, are there genes that modify the survival of these mice, make them live longer? And basically what they did to these mice was they gave them uh, things that are actually mutagens that cause mutations. And they began to screen whether any of the mice survive longer than they should have. And what you can see in the black line is, a given is, is the baseline mouse, the, the, the Rett syndrome mouse dying young. And then three different strains out of five that had some kind of mutation in them that extended their lifespan to the right. So you see this is a survival curve. So here 100% are alive and then they're dying quite early for mice. And then another mutation. So they have the Rett syndrome mutation, but they have another mutation that extends their lifespan, OK? So for one of those three strains of mice, they mapped out the gene. It's not trivial once you make this mutation to actually find the underlying mutation. But what they discovered is that this gene, the Rett syndrome gene, which is MECP2, right? right well, the pink one up there, I can't reach that high, tall as I am, uh, controls another gene called SQLE which is involved in cholesterol synthesis. So when you mutate the gene, as you showed in the bottom with the red X, you dysregulate, you make a change in the amount of cholesterol in the brain. How many people here are on statins for their high cholesterol? OK. That's it? <laughs> I am, but all right. Um, so the, the implication of this study was that Perhaps some of the severity of the phenotype in Rett syndrome was caused by this downstream effect on cholesterol metabolism. So they gave these animals statins, and they increased their survival dramatically. Right? So here is, again, the black line is the survival curve. That's the animal with the Rett syndrome mutation. And you give them statins, and you extend their lifespan quite profoundly. So that's the ideal case. right? If you can find a modifier gene Okay, a protective gene in this case. You can do things that, you can, that are just amazing, right? And so the idea of trying to understand what makes a girl protected can ultimately bring us to a point of better and better treatments, right? So that's where we are with Rett syndrome. So we'll, I'll talk very briefly about a couple of possible mechanisms of why girls are protected. And one area we have to focus on is the sex chromosomes. So um, there are two, X and Y. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Uh, and boys and girls have different numbers of each. Girls have two X, and boys have one X and one Y. So here are the human chromosomes. We have 22 of them that are the autosomes, the non-sex chromosomes. And then we have either two Xs for girls or an X and a Y for boys. So those are the sex chromosomes. And Looking at the X chromosome, we know that men have one copy and girls have two copies. And we also know that if there is a rare loss of X in a girl, they have more social disability and they have more rates, rates of autism. So one of the interesting or important things about, these, about the uh, sex chromosomes is that you know, the, 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 the Y chromosome from the man goes to the boys and the X chromosome you know, there's two of them and go to either boy. So this is for the germ forming uh, egg or sperm, right? So you have two copies of a chromosome and you split it, sp split them in two, and you package them to egg or sperm. 
So this interesting mode of inheritance of the sex chromosomes means you get something like this. On the left-hand side, you see that mom has two X chromosomes, right? And one of them has a red mutation. So mom has a mutation that, is not, that she doesn't express because she has a healthy copy of the same gene. But if she passes that X chromosome down to a boy, that boy doesn't have the healthy copy anymore, right? So now that boy can manifest with a disorder. And fragile X syndrome, I think you all know, is an example of this. And so with those kinds of X-linked disorders, you can actually see situations like this where you have many, many people in a family who are affected because a mom without symptoms can pass it on to a boy who will have symptoms or can pass it on to a daughter who will be a carrier for the next generation. So on the X chromosome, which certainly is a big part of autism, there's no question about it, we have made enormous progress in understanding some of the gene loci associated with the X chromosome. Um, everybody disagrees on the exact number, but I think we can say you know, that in terms of autism and related disorders, there are probably between 50 and 100 genes on the X chromosome that we know something about that contribute to risk. So that accounts for some of the liability to autism uh, in boys versus girls. The other side of the X chromosome is the Y chromosome, and this is the male-specific chromosome. And again, in rare cases of extra chromosomes, um, if you have an XYY, you do have higher rates of autism. So what's going on in the Y chromosome, which is really a tiny chromosome? It has only about 80 protein coding genes. And um, one of them that we know about that's very important is called SRY, which is sex determining region Y. And it's a gene that is critically important in inducing the tissue around um, testicular development. And once the testicles start to develop, they release a lot of hormones, the androgens, that are critical for the entire development of the male versus female um, everything. So uh, not only SRY, but there are other genes on the Y chromosome that show, well, first SRY is also expressed in the brain throughout life. So it must be doing something with our kind of male versus female uh, specific behaviors. And there's a great paper called The Inconvenient Truth. Uh, or the not so inconvenient truth that says, you know, boys and girls, men and women are different in important ways. And I think that's important to kind of acknowledge that. Um, but in addition to SRY, there are probably many other genes, at least 10 other genes on the Y chromosome that are expressed throughout life. And clearly, girls don't have them and boys do have them, right? So they're, they're, going, to, they're going to sculpt in subtle ways the differences in behavior and reaction to illness, uh, autoimmunity, things like that. So, um, you know, this kind of leads to this idea of the extreme male brain theory of autism, which Simon Baron Cohen postulated some time ago, which basically says that, you know, on the spectrum of kind of behaviors, males are closer, in some sense, to autism than females. And I wish it wasn't so blurry, but there are a lot of measures like uh, emotional quotient uh, or autism-like quotients that you can look in typically developing boys and girls, and you'll see the girls have a higher EQ, they're more empathic, and the boys have a, a higher autism score, even if they're typically developing. And there are also neurobiological things that seem to map to that that are also, it's, it, this is kind of autism is greater than male, which is greater than female, and here female is greater than male, uh, greater than autism. So there's kind of like a, you know, a, a gradient of both behaviors and neurobiology that um, seem to kind of map to this idea of more male-like is greater liability for autism and more female-like is more protective. So here's the problem and here's why I said to Allison, I don't want to give this talk. <laughs> the, we can't change maleness or femaleness. That's probably going to be very hard to reduce to a therapeutic approach, okay? But it's not impossible. I mean, we don't want to change maleness in film. I guess that's the most important thing. So there are a lot of smart people out there, and one of them is this guy, Arthur Arnold, who created mice, again, genetically modified mice, where he took that SRY, that male-specific gene that's so important in developing all the testicular tissue and then the androgens, and he put it on another chromosome so he could create four kinds of mice. Mice that are normal female mice, normal male mice, or mice that have female chromosomes but have that male SR1 that induces gonads. So they actually get testicles, okay? They have, they have male sexual development. Or 
male mice without that gene that have female development. So completely segregating the, 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 the people are looking really puzzled. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about this axis that we're trying to dis dissociate. The whole development of the, of the male or female kind of hormone system versus changes, for example, due to the differences in the chromosomes in the brain. If we could look at those separately and not have to worry about the confound of the hormonal environment and just look at the effect of these genes in the brain, we can conceivably develop methodologies that can Look, identify a protective factor without changing the maleness or the femaleness of the person or the animal in this case. So that's kind of, I mean, I think we, we could probably sit down today and map out a strategy that would actually do this with these mice. Right? So whoops, just to show you, just to kind of summarize, you know, he's able to dissociate traits and behaviors and even risk to disease that are mediated by the chromosomes themselves versus the SRY and the downstream uh, sex hormones and androgens, right? So that really would be a toehold into beginning to understand how you can use this, this, this kind of gender difference to think about modifying genes without actually changing maleness or femaleness. So I think there is a way. Um, and of course, the way that I showed you earlier, which is to take a gene that's known to be associated with autism, like MECP2, and then look for modifiers of severity in animals is another way of getting to uh, modifier genes, and some of which are going to be gender specific. So um, this is my last slide. I just wanted to kind of summarize that this idea of taking a disease, any disease, and identifying ideologies, causes, in this case I'm saying genes, allows you to make model systems, to modify, to mutate it in a mouse, to mutate it in a rat, to work on stem cells and culture, and learn something about biology, which you just can't do in a human population easily. That can lead to drug development and novel therapeutics that go back to the patient. This pathway, you know, it, it is amazing how a few years ago it didn't exist, and now there are multiple clinical trials on autism that are derived just from this model of kind of translational medicine. So I think in some sense, autism is leading the field in terms of science-driven novel drug therapies. And you've heard about them in Fragile X syndrome, in Rett syndrome, we're doing one in Field McDermott syndrome. The list goes on and on and on. That there's, you know, these are drugs, these are compounds that have been, that arose from hard research and work in the animals, they're effective in the animals, and we don't know yet, right? But we hope this will be a, a new era of um, treatment in autism spectrum disorders that will have profound impact. And so all this basic science work of gene discovery and model systems, be it looking at modifier genes or anything else, I think is gonna continue to revolutionize the treatment of autism uh, for the next years. So I'll stop there. <laughs>